So I am joined by two women who are tremendous activists, organizers. Um, it's an honor to be here on this panel with the two of you. Um, our third panelist uh, got a little bit of a late start, Rashonda Womack, uh, also from Flint. Uh, she's going to try to meet us out at Maddie's Circle. So the way that this is going to work and all the title track panels work is we do a panel where these folks get a chance to really speak. And we might have a little bit of time for some questions, but most of the questions and the discussion will happen directly after this in Maddie's Circle. And so... Um, Title track, uh, our mission is, is focused around uh, engaging creative practice to build resilient social ecological systems. Social ecological systems recognizes that ecosystems and social systems are intrinsically and irrevocably uh, connected. So whatever we do to the ecosystem, we do to ourselves uh, and, and, and vice versa. So to build resilient social ecological systems that support clean water, racial equity, and youth empowerment. And I have come to understand that uh, the, the environmental movement needs to be centered around justice and that it is a fact that indigenous communities and communities of color uh, disproportionately bear the brunt of environmental degradation and injustices of, of basically every kind in our society. And, um, and it's not about personal preference when we're talking about issues of racial justice. It's about the system's sickness. It's about structural uh, injustice that needs to be dismantled and healed. And as it relates to water, it's, it's very, very clear. We've seen it in so many ways uh, with the Detroit water shutoffs um, and, of course, prominently uh, on the world stage with the Flint water crisis. So Amber Hassan is joining us from Flint, Michigan. Amber is an activist, uh, an MC, uh, a ghetto girl, loudmouth ghetto girl, podcaster, vodcaster, <laughs> um, spoken word artist, poet, uh, visionary. And uh, we're also joined by Marky Miller with Toledoans for Safe Water. And Marky has been on an amazing ride here in the last year uh, because uh, some of you have heard about this uh, Lake Erie Bill of Rights, right? Where this small group of thoughtful, concerned citizens uh, worked very hard to pass the Lake Erie Bill of Rights to give rights to nature, to give rights to Lake Erie. And this made national news and international news. So uh, it was a very difficult uh, and challenging effort. And, and Marky uh, w spearheaded this effort. And we're so grateful to have you here. Um, and, and we have a lot to learn about this. Um, so I'm going to let you two do the talking. I would love for uh, each of you to just kind of introduce yourself in your own words. What brought you into this work uh, around water equity um, and protecting water? How the connection exists between people's desire to um, protect the water and justice issues and uh, kind of what led you to this stage right now? And I'm going to shut off this snare drum too so it doesn't rattle through the whole set. Hello. Y'all haven't woke up this morning. Hey, how y'all doing? All right, all right. Um, as he said, I'm Amber Hassan, self-proclaimed loudmouth ghetto girl, so it's okay if you say it. Um, and I am from Flint, Michigan, born and raised. So um, if you don't know, Flint has been for the past five years without um, safe, clean, drinking water for maybe the past 10 years we've been without affordable drinking water people don't talk about that a lot but our water bills have been double what and right now triple but normally they're double what the rest of the country pays for water um just for example my water bill i don't even use the water at my house but we automatically have to pay 80 dollars per month and that's just for service fees so <laughs> Um, just think you don't use the water and then you get a bill for 80 bucks, how, how that feels. So um, right now uh, in Flint, Michigan, we still don't have clean and safe drinking water. Um, 
two days ago, I, well, the 18th, I don't even know what today's date is. I'm kind of in festival mode. But um, so on the 18th, we had a boil water advisory because two water mains broke, um, causing more problems. Um, right before that, maybe three, four weeks ago, we had the sewer back up into the Flint River. So this is an ongoing issue. It's been going on. The Flint River has been polluted since the early, the, you know, the 1930s or 40s. Um, and, but we weren't using that water. And I think, you know, um, what's really important is that the policies that were passed, um, that were voted against by the people of Flint, um, still were put into place because we were put under an emergency manager situation. So even, you know, people always say, get out and vote, make your voice be heard. Well, we got out, we got out in numbers and we voted and we voted against it strongly and we still were put in this oppressive, um, dangerous situation. You know, and it, for those who don't know, it, we had um, high lead levels in our water and with high lead levels, it only tests for 30 days after you've been exposed. So say my children were exposed and I didn't find out, which we didn't. We didn't find out for um, about two years after the water switch. So I still, at this, at this time, I don't know if my children were affected. Um, we didn't drink the water much, but if they were at school or at a friend's house or a family member's house or a restaurant, um, they may have been lead exposed. I may have been lead exposed. I have an, a, a compromised immune system because I have lupus that could have attributed to, you know, different things with that. So um, it's, it's a very serious situation still. Uh, hi, my name is Marky Miller um, from Toledo, Ohio, not far from Flint. And I know the Flint water crisis happened, I think, just after the Toledo water crisis. So we were kind of going through these crazy situations at the same time. Um, in 2014, 500,000 people in, in Toledo and the surrounding suburbs that use that intake well in Lake Erie, uh, we were told at 2 in the morning, don't drink the water, don't touch the water. Don't give your dog water. Don't water the lawn. Don't run your tap. Don't boil it. We, we don't know, but it's toxic. Uh, more details to come. That's a horrifying message to wake up to. Um, and that was a message only available to those who had access to Facebook, had access to the Internet. Uh, the news outlets are picking it up, but it was a Saturday morning. Not everybody got up and put the news on. By that time, you've already made your coffee, you've already brushed your teeth, you've had your shower, you've made breakfast for your kids, um, and you're just being told, we don't know why, but don't, don't touch it. Uh, we, got, we got frustrated with that. We, we saw how vulnerable we were. All of a sudden, it's bottled water, uh, shelves are empty, the lines outside grocery stores are all the way around the corner, people are waiting for rations of water, at local high schools and churches, from uh, federal agencies, uh, and you didn't know how long this was going to last. And when it was over, you didn't know if it was going to happen again. So although I, I don't think we suffered as, as long and as extensively as the people of Flint, um, we're still dealing with this idea of we don't trust the water, we don't trust the people in charge of our water, and why are we paying to treat a problem that should not be there in the first place. Uh, people are losing access. They are being priced out of their bill. And on top of that, Lake Erie has become so bad that the surrounding suburbs don't want to tap into the city water anymore. They want to go to an aquifer hundreds of miles away and take their water. Uh, so, you know, this, this idea of, of having safe, reliable water is, is starting to affect people from all different communities. And, you know, it's not right that we ha should have to say, this water is not good enough, we're going to go take somebody else's. So on all fronts, we're working on local initiatives to try and get community voice, trying to get community rights, rights of nature, rights for the aquifer, rights for Lake Erie, so that we don't have to have people choose between you know, getting bottled water or going without, or wondering how long have I been exposed to this? How long are the effects going to be there? What are the, what are the impacts of this now highly, highly treated water I have to drink? Um, these are questions that we don't wanna have to deal with anymore. So I wanna just take a moment 
to invite uh, everybody. This is some heavy stuff. It's very real stuff, and sometimes it can get overwhelming in our minds. Um, so just take a moment to be in your body and feel the earth supporting you and how wonderful it is that we're here on the planet and that the weight of our minds and bodies can be supported by the earth right now as we continue to have this conversation and uh, feel that support if things start to get really heavy and you find your, your mind wanting to go somewhere else. It's natural because it is overwhelming and it's a lot. Um, yeah. Okay, so Amber, would you be willing to speak a little bit about your personal experience uh, and kind of the parallel between uh, Flint and Puerto Rico in your story? Um, so in 2016, I decided, okay, I'm not dealing with this water crisis, not my monkey, not my circus, I'm just leaving. Um, Cause it just got so overwhelming, it was just like, come to the bottle of water giveaway and then you sit in line for three hours to get bottle of water. Walmart doesn't have water or they raise the price of water to this ridiculous price and you know, all these other things. So I'm like, I'm gone. And I love Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is one of my favorite places on earth. So I'm like, I'm going to Puerto Rico. And so we found this great house, two acres. And I was like, yeah, moving to Puerto Rico. <laughs> moved to Puerto Rico and eight months after we moved, Hurricane Maria came. And um, my youngest, who isn't over here, he was stuck in Puerto Rico with family. I was here working on my EP, and he was there. And he was two, so I had to get over there. Um, and it was one of the, the, the best experiences of my life to actually get over there. I got over there four days after Maria. I mean, it's actually the anniversary of Maria. The two-year anniversary was just the other day. Um, got over there, um, and it was just, like, something I had never seen. But it was... It was sad to me that the situations were parallel as far as the Flint water crisis and what I had to deal with in Puerto Rico. Because with the Flint water crisis, they had taken a first world community and basically, like, you would literally see lines for blocks for people trying to get water. And, you know, you would go to stores, and even I will go to stores and there won't be any water. But you would go to stores and the water would be, you know, gone. And then you had people from outlying suburbs coming in to get the free water. You had churches who were, you know, didn't have anywhere to store this water, so they're leaving it outside in 90-degree temperatures. And then people are still coming to pick the water up. And it was just a really heavy situation. Everybody was on edge. Everybody was, you know, like volatile at that time. Nobody knew if they had been lead poisoned. Nobody knew what had happened with their children and lead poison. And, and, you know, it was just all over the place. Now I got to Puerto Rico and I got to see that same chaos. And one situation was man-made, one situation was natural, but the, the thing that connected them was the way that the government systems handled the issues. In Flint, People who did not speak English did not get information for the first year after the water crisis. There was, we have a, a very large Spanish speaking community and a very large Arabic speaking community. Neither one of those communities were given information. And if, if you think about it, um, coming from maybe a Latin American country or coming from a Middle Eastern country, if they have water issues, normally it's bacterial. So they're told to boil water. So that was their first thought was to boil the water. But you have people boiling lead water, which is more dangerous because it's more dangerous to inhale lead fumes mm -hmm. than it is to actually consume the lead water. So you had that situation going on. And so when I was in Puerto Rico, they would come through the neighborhood with like this bullhorn on a truck, you know, saying in Spanish, there's gonna be a water giveaway at the basketball court at whatever time it was. And so I spoke well enough Spanish to where I could understand what they were saying, but you know, there were people in the community that did not speak Spanish and did not know what was being said. So in both situations, it was kind of overlooked that there may be community members that don't have that privilege of speaking the native tongue of, of the, the place. And, um, you know, so being able to see it from both ends and being able to see how um, corporations and government systems take advantage of disasters, whether natural or man-made, it was like you could see these people coming in to do this disaster relief and everybody wants a photo op and everybody wants to have their name be said that they donated this money, but who did you donate it to? What organization was it? Who do they represent? What do the people want? 
that's a big thing. When doing any kind of disaster relief or doing any kind of activism, you should involve the people that you call yourself helping. You know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna come to your house and say, oh, you need it painted in here, let me paint. But you're like, nah, I really need a water heater. Like, don't spend all that money on paint when I need a water heater. And so I think that's kind of what it is. It's like, we're gonna give out Band-Aids and then we're gonna walk away and we're gonna feel good about ourselves because we, you know, we help these people. And it's like, no, we're not these people, we are you. You know what I'm saying? All of us are each other because tomorrow it could be here. Like, that's how easy it is. I hadn't even until maybe, I think it was last year, heard about the situation in Toledo. So you can you imagine waking up at two in the morning, you know, this message being sent out at two in the morning and nobody else in the country really hears about it? Like what kind of, like as, as big as social media is, these things are still kept in a bubble. And I think that's, you know, that was what moved me the most is that no matter where you are, no matter who the people are, the thing is still the same. These systems have to be broken down to where they really serve the people. And we as the people have to break these systems down so that they serve us. Thank you, Amber. So connecting on that thread of, of changing the system, um, Marky, can you talk a little bit about the process um, of deciding to go to the source, of recognizing that you know, corporations are given rights um, and it's something that we've all come to accept, but the idea of nature having rights uh, it is Crazy. kind of, it's wild, <laughs> right? And, and people have probably grilled you about that over the last year. But talk about the process and, and if you would be willing um, to give a couple other examples of where this has been practiced and sure. some places where it might be in the works now. Yeah, um, and what you said it really spoke <laughs> to a lot of, of what my community is doing that uh, we, we've come to learn, and now it's our kind of our mantra that the system is fixed and we need to break it. <laughs> I, I'm tired of people telling me it's broken, go fix it. No, it's working just fine for the people who designed it, for the people it's meant to work for. And by people, I'm talking about corporations <laughs> on that end. Um, we're, we, were, we were set up to fail, basically. Uh, so what my community did was we waited for a, a little while to see what actions came, came forward, to see what, what policies were gonna be put into place, and it was nothing. We were told to be quiet. We were told we couldn't ask questions at town halls, at town meetings. Um, if you wanna talk about the algae, if you wanna talk about what caused it, that's not what this time is for. We only wanna, we only wanna move forward from this. Um, if you don't know where you've been, I don't know how you can know where you're going. And so we organized and wrote a law that said locally, Lake Erie has personhood rights. It has the right to thrive, to exist, to flourish. And we as the community that has to take care of that, that we, we depend on this ecosystem, we have a right to say no to projects and permits that threaten those rights, that threaten the rights of the lake, threaten our right to succeed, um, which is apparently um, not a common idea <laughs> in most places, um, but it sounds very logical to all of us. So we, we drafted the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. Um, we collected 10,500 signatures. We were kept off the ballot. We were in and out of the Supreme Court. We were told you're not allowed to vote on this. A huge campaign to stop us that spent over $300,000 led by BP out of Houston, Texas, called us outsiders, manipulators, and meddlers on our own radio stations, on, on our televisions. Um, I got mail that came to my own address calling me an outsider. <laughs> and urging people not to vote on this, that we're gonna hurt churches and families and jobs. And, um, but the bottom line was that we didn't have any of that if we didn't have water. Uh, you know, so that, that was really the foundation. And luckily, those corporate campaigners really helped our case. They really made themselves look really outrageous, really bad, that our community had been through this experience together. You know, it didn't matter if your, uh, you know, if your children were dependent on that water, it didn't matter if it was that you couldn't take your giant boat out that day. You were, you were affected, right? You felt this. 
there was no, no amount of money or power that protected you from this vulnerable situation. It hit everybody. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was really easy for people to say, wait, we've, we've watched this group for two years be part of this community. We all went through this experience. We all felt it in different ways. So um, luckily we could identify that as a, as a huge threat to us. Um, but we decided we didn't want to play by those system rules anymore. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't about following them or making, making the, the electeds or making corporations follow the rules. It was about changing those rules. And it's, it's still, the, that is the main thing. Um, it doesn't matter if you can plug in any community. It can be Flint, it can be Toledo, Puerto Rico, and any uh, obstacle, any harm, right? Pipelines, injection wells, um, <laughs> It can be the lead, it can be factory farming. And the bottom line is, we have a democracy problem. We don't get a say in how this stuff comes into our world and how this stuff impacts us. And we get a little focused on, we need to work in this one community on this one project, but it's all following the same calculation. It's all following the same formula. And until you change that formula, I don't think you're gonna see the change that you really, really need to start creating sustainable, healthy communities. Um, as far as rights of nature in other locations, the, the first rights of nature law in the world was in Tamaqua, Pennsylvania in 2006. Um, no one really challenged it, it was just a small village. They were tired of, of coal ash polluting their waterways, polluting their airways, and they, they put a stop to it by passing a local ordinance. Um, and then to follow, in 2008, Ecuador wrote rights of nature into their entire constitution. And now we have rivers in, in Nepal and, and the Great Barrier Reef in Australia that are all working on initiatives or have passed them. Um, New Zealand is working on stuff. There's, there's uh, regulations in, in Bolivia. Uh, it's, it's happening worldwide. And it was really great to see Toledo become part of that. We were the first in the US to have a rights of nature law that was for a specific ecosystem for a specific body of water. And since then, I'm, I've had people in Florida contact me saying, we're gonna do this for our rivers. We're gonna do this for the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, they're working on rights of nature right now and they don't have the time that we had to, to put this forward. You know, their, their threat's happening right now. Um, but they're trying to get rights of nature to stick so that they can protect that sacred space. Um, the Salish Sea in Washington. I know you've probably heard the stories of the, the mother orcas who are found carrying around their dead babies for weeks, mourning, and, and they're found in the Salish Sea, and this is happening more and more and more, and, and people are tired of it. We're tired of paying for it. We're tired of, of testifying and, and getting experts and getting lawyers and feeling heard and then going invisible. So that's really what needs to change. Thank you, Marky. Yeah. So Amber, um, I have a lot of people ask me, you know, what can we do for Flint? Who are the organizations to support? What are, what's the latest? What are people doing now? Um, can you speak a little bit to that from your perspective? And also, um, I think you, you've already both touched on this a little bit. Um, there's uh, there's the disaster capitalism, which is where people um, they see a disaster and it's an opportunity for them to profit. And then there's also the other side of that, where disasters bring out the the basic goodness of people, and you see the goodness of humanity come together to make miracles happen. So if you could speak to maybe both of those things, Amber. Okay. Thank you. Um. So. As far as organizations in Flint um, to support, I would say um, look for grassroots groups. I don't want to give any names. I don't want, you know what I'm saying? Because I don't, I don't know what's going on in these organizations. And I don't ever want to push anybody to, well, let me, let me take that back. Ashbury Church has a very, very good community programming. They have just um, bought a bunch of abandoned lots on the east side of Flint, which was a, is a very higher hit area of Flint. Um, it has a large uh, Spanish-speaking community, large immigrant community, um, large undocumented community. 
And so Ashbury Church has bought up a lot of land in that area, and they are building community farms where they're doing community farming. They're selling the produce, but they're selling it in order to um, get community members to take ownership of some of the plots that they have. They have about 20 hoop houses right now, um, and they're, they're, they're building more. And so one of the ways to, um, to deal with lead poisoning is through nutrition. Um, so that is one of the, the efforts, and a lot of efforts have been put into nutrition. Uh, Flint Fresh is another group that um, is working from the nutrition standpoint. Um, we have a lot of groups doing some stuff that um, is great work, and that, that's my thing. Some of this stuff is great ideas, but it's kind of scattered out. So everything is like, you know, if we took all of it and put it into one you know, really comprehensive plan, it would be really amazing and we can get some stuff done. But it's like, everybody is like, oh, I'm gonna donate 30 bottle cases of water here and I'm gonna donate, you know, this here. And so it's kind of all over the place. Um, but yeah, Ashbury Church, um, Flint Fresh, I think New Jerusalem Church is also doing some really great things. Um, the Muslim Food Pantry of Flint, they're also doing some really good things. So a lot of these groups are nonprofits, of course. They're religious groups. And some people don't like dealing with religious groups, but these groups I know are actually doing the work on the ground. They're not just, you know, out doing photo ops. They do the everyday work. Um, we got kind of frustrated with not really, you know, having a solution. So while I was in Puerto Rico, um, you know, I, everybody was just really family. Everybody, you know, in our community was really great. So we wanted to go back and we wanted to do some relief work. Um, so we went back six months after um, Hurricane Maria to do some work. We went to one of the smaller islands off the coast, um, which is part of Puerto Rico. It's called Vieques. Vieques still to this day does not have a hospital because of water damage. Um, but we met this guy, this amazing guy named Moses West, and he created an atmospheric water generator. And so it's basically like a huge dehumidifier. It pulls water out of the air, it ionizes it. His technology is the only technology that's recognized by the U.S. government. The U.S. military buys his machines for, you know, whatever they use them for. Uh, but he was on Vieques supplying that island with water from this machine. And so we met him, and he was just, you know, out there running the machine itself. People were coming up, pulling up, getting their own water. And we were like, oh, this is amazing, you know, that, that, that you're doing this. And so we, he was like, hey, I we wanted to come to Flint, but then Maria <laughs> happened. And so we were like, well, let's work on getting you to Flint. So we worked really diligently for a year, keeping in touch, just trying to find creative ways where we could get him to Flint. He came to Flint so he could meet with some government officials. Everybody was kind of like, yeah, call my secretary, set up a meeting some other time. What are we getting out of this? And so he was like, you know what? F that. I'm giving you guys uh, the collective that I work with. It's a, a, a women's um, artist collective. It's called the Sister Tour. And he said, I'm going to give the Sister Tour this machine. We have some property. And so he was like, I'm going to give you this machine. We just got to raise 50000 to get it there. Another amazing artist, Latoya Ruby Frazier. If you don't know who she is, she's a photographer. She is like uh, amazing. She's a good friend of mine, and she raised the fifty thousand. She actually gave twenty five thousand out of her own pocket and raised the other twenty five thousand to get the machine to Flint. The machine got to Flint maybe forty days ago. We have given out twelve over twelve thousand gallons of water in the last forty days. Um, the machine can only run until, uh, until the temperature drops below 45 degrees, then the machine won't, won't be effective. And so what Moses is going to do, he's going to try to take that machine to the Bahamas, but he's going to bring back his new model machine, which is much more efficient, um, runs off solar. He's bringing that to Flint um, probably April of next year so that we can start again. And we're going to start banking water so that people will have water put away. Um, and we're just trying to come up with some real solutions. We're trying to get these machines for every ward of Flint because right now we just have it in our ward where our business is because that's where our property was. Um, but that ward was a really hard hit area. It's on the north side of Flint. But we, so if you want to... Um, Water Rescue Fund or the sistertour.com, you can go and you can donate to help with that effort. Um, and so, you know, really anybody, if you're looking for people, look for grassroots people, look for people who are really, you know, doing the work that the people want. The Boys and Girls Club of Flint is doing really good work. Um, 
youth organizations, Flint Community Schools needs water. So if you want to donate water, then you just like, I just want to donate some water. You know, Flint Community Schools definitely needs water. Mm -hmm. They don't have, you know, they don't have water that they can use in the school buildings and they don't get donations of water. So um, that's me personally, that's who I would. I would second, you want me to answer the same question? Oh. Or do you have a different yeah, question? Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I would just, okay. I would just second the grassroots aspect 100%. Um, well, I've tried to touch base with different organizations who are a little more established or maybe take donations from other entities and they don't want to rock the boat. Yeah. So, you know, don't be afraid to do a little vetting and before you support someone, um, you know, see how far they're willing to go with things because it's, if you're not willing to make a difference, then it's, it's probably not something that you want to put a lot of your time and money and resources into. Uh, we work with the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, or CELDEF. They, they help us with uh, making sure all of our legal stuff is in order, that our petitions are, are um, legitimate, that they have all the, the boxes ticked. They've backed us up with the legal support that, that we've needed that we wouldn't be able to have otherwise, but um, you know, worst case scenario, start your own group. Uh, that was my call to action. You know, make sure that you can you can call your electeds, you can call the decision makers, you can meet the the corporations halfway, um, or you can bring them to your level by calling your neighbors, calling your friends, your coworkers and decide what you want to see in your community. Nobody knows better than you guys who are on the ground, who are involved, who are living it and experiencing it. Uh, so don't be afraid to, to get started. I mean, it's kind of a learn as you go experience in, in most cases, but when you're not censored by donors, when, when you have the, the free reign to say what you want, to, to say what you're not hearing being said, um, there's nothing more empowering than that. Even if, if things don't happen that day, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's so great to be able to say, no, this, this needs to happen. This, this is what needs to be said. And, and don't let anyone hold you back on that. Um, for Flint, there's also an organization called Flint Rising. They're doing a lot of great work in Flint. Um, Neighborhood Engagement Hub is one. They do a lot of work, good work in Flint. And if you do want to donate for the water machine, you can also go to Regular Hero. Um, it may be .org, I'm not sure. But Regular Hero will take donations directly for the water machine. Just if you make a donation, just put specifically um, Flint Water Machine when you, when you give a donation online. And it will go straight for the water machine. And that does not... That money goes for containers, basically, because that's what we need. We need BPA-free containers so that people, because we have people coming with water bottles that they have been, you know, getting from the store and stuff like that. And although it's better than having the water out the faucet, it still can cause health problems down the, down the line, and that's not really what we want. So BPA-free containers um, and those organizations are who I would put out there. Thank you. Marky, um, can you talk a little bit about the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund and um, how they played a role in this? Mm -hmm. And uh, also, you just on the topic of grassroots, um, I, mean, I just think it's incredible what you did. And, and just feel that for a second, everybody. They, they wrote the Toledo Bill of Rights. Like, they just decided to do that, and they did that. Any of you could do that. We can do that. And I'm going to say that we will do that. This will happen in Michigan. Um, and you had this ally show up that has been kind of showing up at these other places. But so to talk about Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, CELDEF, and then really what the grassroots looks like, like the number of people, the budget that you were working with, how you raised the money, you know? Budgets. But the budget doesn't <laughs> feel like the right word. Um, so I, I, I love CELDEF. Um, just a brief, brief how I got into that. Uh, I, was, I was a grad student pursuing an environmental science degree thinking I'm going to work for the EPA and I'm going to make a difference. And <laughs> my dreams were shattered real fast in those classes in realizing I don't, I don't want to write permits. I, I don't want to regulate harm. I want to stop harm. And um, walked away from that degree feeling like I, I, I don't want this. I, I don't want to be part of it. I don't want to be part of this 
field. Um, and I felt like I had failed the environmental movement, you know, that I was supposed to, this was, this was my role in the world. This is, was going to be my thing. And, and I suddenly had no role to play. Um, so when I left is when I came home and ex the Toledo water crisis happened. Um, and CELDEF about a year later was in a, a neighboring community doing a presentation on rights of nature, on, on local self-governance, on community rights. And a couple people from Toledo were in the audience, pulled them aside and said, we need your help. <laughs> we, we, we love this. We want to do this too. Our community is, is, is hurting, is suffering, it's under attack. Um, and everything you're talking about is, is playing into this. And uh, the Lake Erie Bill of Rights was actually born in a bar on a, on a napkin. <laughs> you know, that's true grassroots. <laughs> and um, my first experience with them was when word was get, getting around that, hey, there's this idea. It's called the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. I don't know anything about it, but here's someone you can call to learn more. And it felt like everything that we talked about in that phone call was everything that was missing from my environmental education. You know, I, the, the frustration I felt that I didn't know how to verbalize because that was the environmental movement. That was the system that you put yourself into to, to make a change. And I just knew I wanted nothing to do with it. So when they told, started talking to me and started telling me that there was you know, you don't have to accept that. You can, you can make the decisions. You can, you can do this. Um, there was no, no time to sit and think, do I want to do this? I was like, hell yeah, let's do it right now. Um, rights of nature, it was the first time I had heard that phrase, and I was totally on board because I, I knew I didn't want to get involved with that. And they, they helped us draft the language where we said, this is what we want, um, and they put that into the legal terms that we needed, made sure our petitions were in order. Um, and they've also provided us with uh, free legal support um, that you don't often get <laughs> in a lot of places or you've, that's where your fundraising has to go. And, and even though a lot of the cases we didn't win at first, we kept going back to court. We kept pushing it through. We had other communities with similar initiatives trying to push through and eventually did get the outcome that we wanted with a little bit of patience and persistence. Um, so they, they work with any community that's willing to work with them as long as you're willing to do some of the legwork to collect the signatures. Um, they can't come in and say, this is what you're going to do. Uh, but if you call them and say, this is what we want to do, will you help us? Will you help us get that organized? Uh, they, they are there for you. They'll, they'll do that. Um, you know, they're a, a nonprofit law firm that started out trying to repeal and uh, uh, revoke permits community said, this project's coming in, I don't want it, it's going to be harmful, and they would win their case because they'd find a flaw in the permit, they'd find an error. Um, the project would refile with now an ironclad permit, totally nothing you could do more legally to revoke it, and they were receiving all these awards for their great environmental work, but they felt like they were failing the communities that they were helping because eventually the harm would happen anyway. The community would be, would be subject to those harms and they wanted to do something different. So that's when they started doing more of the grassroots organizing, the democracy work. They're a great resource if this stuff is really new to you or um, if you've been involved in traditional activism and want to try something a little bit different. They let you call the shots, and they're there to support you with whatever help you need in, in getting that put together. Thank you. Uh, and I'll mention too, yeah, um, I've been in conversation with some folks with the Clearwater, which is an organization that Pete Seeger started. Um, Pete Seeger was born 100 years ago, and the, he, he and Toshi started the Clearwater to protect the Hudson River uh, 50 years ago. and. Um, they reached out to me um, through Rachel Marco Havens, and Rachel had put, put me in touch with some folks there, and uh, we had connected a little bit at the Summer Hoot, Mike and Ruthie from the Mammals uh, organization. And the, the conversation has come up to have an indigenous-centered movement to, um, to grant rights to the Hudson River. And um, I connected them with CELDEF, and now they're working with CELDEF, that's so that, that's got some traction there, too. Uh, so part of, part of this work is, is um, you know, being in it 
for the long haul, right? And we've all gone through resistance fatigue. I think I'm not alone in that, right? And so um, one of the things that helps us is, is the arts, right? And uh, I was just wondering, Amber, if you could bless us with, with some words, with some bars maybe. So um, I'm going to do this piece that I think I'm, I did yesterday, and I'm probably going to do it at the Water Blessing today, but I don't think it can be heard enough. Um, I, so just a little background with Flint. Like, yeah, Flint is going through a water crisis, which is horrible. But Flint is also going through a crisis where young black men are dying. And I'm talking about under 18, like 17, 16, 15-year-old. One of my best friends is a principal and she called me last night in tears because three of her current students um, were murdered yesterday. Last week, one was murdered. Week before that, two. Week before that, three. Week before that, one. She has been to eight funerals this month of current students at her school. And so, um, this piece in the chorus, it, I'm gonna do it as a spoken word piece, but in the chorus it says, choppers keep flying around here, but people keep dying, I swear. I can't drink the water and I can't afford the bills. If you're sick of this shit, better pop another pill. I'm robbing Peter just to pay Paul to buy water that I can't drink. They'll kill you and say that you enjoyed yourself. Keep your eyes on them, don't blink. Things ain't black and white as you think. I can't trust the water out of my sink. I can't trust the words up out of they mouth because they'll pump the poison right to your house. And I'm saying choppers keep flying around here. But people keep dying, I swear. I can't drink the water and I can't afford the bills. If you're sick of this shit, better pop another pill. They'll kill you and say that you paid for it. Had a master plan and you slaved for it. Got our babies bathing in contamination and they'll cut you off if you late for it. The city, it's trying to blame the state for it. And the state, they ain't gonna never pay for it. Give us band-aids for our bullet wounds. They'll kill us without making the bullets boom. Even thug stressing. Got babies at the doctors getting blood tested. I got tons of questions. Googling symptoms for lesioners. This is much worse than our deepest fears. We get apologies for the policies that poisoned our whole city. No warrants issued, no charges filed. Snyder's still at the crib sitting pretty. And I'm saying choppers keep flying around here. But people keep dying, I swear. I can't drink the water and I can't afford the bills. If you're sick of this shit, better pop another pill. They're killing us softly like Roberta say. More scared of a shower than the murder rate. We've been screaming in silence. All they see is the violence. These are the problems of the first world today. By the waters ain't gonna cut it. So I'm spitting this with no filter. Murder mitten is such a fitting title because even the governor was a killer. And I'm saying choppers keep flying around here. But people keep dying, I swear. I can't drink the water and I can't afford the bills. If you're sick of this shit, better pop another pill. Thank y'all. So, um... We only have a, a few more minutes here, and uh, I wanted to mention that um, our friends with We the People of Detroit were really hoping to be here as a part of this panel um, and uh, a conversation about water equity and affordability in Michigan is not complete without Detroit being represented. Uh, and it just so happens that Michelle Oberholzer is here. And so uh, Michelle is gonna come up and speak a little bit about the situation in Detroit. Uh, with the last few minutes that we have here in the panel. Um, uh, Monica Lewis Patrick is a part of the, uh, the Water Equity and Affordability Caucus through Policy Link uh, that myself and Chris Good of Title Track are also a part of. Uh, and uh, Naira Sharif with the Flint, Flint Rising. Uh, uh, Nair Sharif is also a, a part of this Water Equity and Affordability Caucus. It's a nationwide group of activists. Um, and uh, Monica and Naira both uh, uh, provided testimony um, to, to uh, US Congress recently in, in Detroit. Um, so Michelle, if you could just say a few words and kind of bring people up to speed. 
Thank you so much. So I'm a, a far secondary representative of this issue than those who represent We the People of Detroit, but I do think it's important to speak about it. Um, so the Detroit water crisis came about at the time of emergency management, so very similar to what happened in Flint. And under the bankruptcy, the primary function of the government was to pay the creditors, pay the debts. It was not to provide water or any other government service. All of those things became secondary. So to the point, we were actually following the law when we cut off water to people. That was supposed to be under this system. Uh, we saw hundreds of thousands of people shut off. Many of those people, I call it, you know, forced eviction or displacement. They leave because they can't survive there anymore. And then that only exacerbates the problem because now the burden is carried by fewer and fewer people and the burden becomes bigger and bigger. So um, those water shutoffs continue in Detroit. We also have extremely high water rates. We've now shifted to a system where you are billed for drainage fees. So you could be someone who can't afford their water, whose water has been shut off. And in addition to the debt that you've incurred, you also have to pay water reconnection fees. You also are incurring additional bills every month because it rained on your lot, on your home. You cannot disconnect from the system and become autonomous with um, water barrels or whatever because you're still having to pay just to be there. I worked with a woman whose water was shut off, her home was foreclosed. So that's my primary work, but these issues coincide over and over again. And she was a, an older woman who grew up drawing water from the well. So she knew how to do it. She knew how to survive this way, but it was different because this time the water was passing by her home. It just wasn't for her, you know? And she ended up suffering um, greatly for years without having access to water, even though due to the foreclosure, the water should have been zeroed out. So it's important that when we hear about water shutoffs, we understand um, the conditions that led to this, why the bills are so high is because the burden's being carried by so few, and the system isn't, there, there's no rule that says it should be affordable. And it's, in some ways it seems counterintuitive when these things are happening in areas that are proximate to the Great Lakes, but that's exactly when those things happen, is when you have something desirable by others, you become victimized by those who have interests and, and greater power to exploit it and to extract it. And so, yeah, <laughs> that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So we're just about at time here. Uh, briefly, Marky, could you just uh, talk a little bit about where you're at right now and how people can help support Toledoans for Safe Water? Sure. Um, so the, the biggest thing that happened uh, quite recently is that the Ohio Chamber of Commerce wrote some language that said um, rights of nature cannot exist in the state of Ohio, handed that to a state representative after the deadline, and said, please put this in the budget bill. Um, so that got approved because it was the next day. There was not even time for any testimony. Um, and so that's our next big thing that we need to tackle is by revoking that on a statewide level. But, um, and I said this at the last panel too, I'm not at all deterred by that because obviously it means we're, we're doing something right, that we're, we're pissing off the right people. Um, we're getting noticed, we're getting attention and uh, we're not going to let a little state preemption get in the way of, of our well-being and, and protecting this ecos ecosystem. So you can, you can support us the best way by it, keeping this movement going. Um, start an organization, start a movement for the rights of Lake Huron, the rights of Lake Michigan, the rights of the rivers that run through your community. Um, don't send them a message that we're going to legitimize the laws that they pass that are harmful to us, that revoke our very right and to, to clean water, our access to safe water, um, or even our right to pass laws. Um, push back. That, that's, that's the biggest thing that you can do, and I, I'm saying that knowing what an undertaking that is. Um, you know, but the knowledge that all of us have here today is only as good as the, the actions it inspires, the actions that it informs. So um, don't be afraid to get, to get that started. None of us knew what we were doing or what we were getting into when we, when we started to get involved. We just knew we had to say something, we had to do something. So keep it moving, get this started in Michigan, grow the rights of nature movement, grow the community rights movement and, and have a strong local voice and 
you know, just because they pass a law that says you can't do that, tell them, yeah, we can and we will. How about a big hand for our panelists, Marky Miller and Amber Hassan.